Good morning. This is Soul School Network for Sunday, March the 17th. And we would like to start our meeting today with a uh, short meditation. So I invite all of you to get comfortable and prepared for that. And then we'll move into our talk today regarding prophecy and Grandfather William Commanda. So here we go. I invite you to close your eyes and settle wherever you are in a chair, hanging down, standing out. <coughs> Connect with your body and know that you are being breathed. The blood is circulating through your body. Your organs are functioning. All is well. the truth of our being, with the soul, and the journey of the soul, and this precious time here in Earth School. And we welcome in thoughts of Grandfather Son, the light of your life the wisdom of the light, warming the Mother Earth and all of its inhabitants. Unveil to us the face of the true spiritual sun, hidden by a disk of golden light, that we may know the truth and do our whole duty as we journey to thy sacred feet. Thank you, Grandfather Son. And we connect with Mother Earth below us. Divine Mother, the love of our lives, who nurtures us, supports us, feeds us, <coughs> us in every kingdom of this beautiful earth school we enjoy because of Mother Earth and Grandfather Son. And continue to notice <coughs> the breath Breathing deeply and slowly, noticing your connection to the earth, how she grounds you and accepts all that you have to offer, whether it is that which you need to release, or is it your behavior that you're offering to Divine Mother? there for you regardless. Continue to notice your breath. 
feel the light of grandfather's sun pouring through the top of your head, circulating through your body, invigorating your trillions of cells, informing you with the wisdom and love of the Father. And as we do this, we consider this time together, this union of souls <coughs> on the soul's journey through the earth school. And we know the perfect nature of all that is, despite appearances otherwise. We are blessed for this opportunity to expand our consciousness, our vision, our love, our wisdom, transforming ourselves through the light of consciousness. And I invite you to notice your breath, notice your body, connect with your hands and your feet and your awareness of this time together, this communion of souls, bringing yourself back to the space that you're in and to this room, and to this time together, with an open heart and an open mind, receiving all that is relevant and uplifting and transforming for you on your soul's journey. Thank you. Welcome back. I hear video. Okay. So, this morning, we are going to have the pleasure of hearing from Grandfather William Commanda and thoughts from Michael Swinwood about his journey with Grandfather and Grandfather's messages. And I have to say, as a family, we had the pleasure of meeting grandfather when our daughter, Allura, was only 20 days old. And Allura will be almost 28 uh, this year, as she will be 28. So it's um, 15 years of a journey with grandfather that we enjoyed. He passed at 97 years old in 2011. I had the privilege of speaking with him over the phone about four hours before he passed. Such a beautiful, beautiful man with so much to share. So we are going to explore the Seven Fires Prophecy of the Algonquin with Michael's yeah. guidance. He enjoyed, he passed at 90. And um, Michael is, of course, a founding member of Soul School Network. He's an Indigenous rights lawyer and activist. And he's now fighting for the recognition of the Amaqua Nation. It's a legal action that's underway in Canada um, that's about to empower the Amaqua Nipissing people. And it's also about standing up in the face of genocide to claim their rightful place among Canada's First Nations. So for 15 years, Michael worked on a series of projects with Grandfather William, who's an Algonquin Indigenous elder. And this is a man who Michael considers his one true teacher. So William Commanda was a true spiritual leader. He was the keeper of several Algonquin wampum belts 
which holds records of prophecies, history, treaties, and agreements. In the years before his death, he shared his wisdom of the seven fires prophecy with Michael. We're very blessed to have Michael's insight on grandfather's words. We have two videos to share so that you can meet grandfather himself and then hear Michael's thoughts afterwards and we'll have an opportunity for your questions toward the end. So the first video is um, Ojigwanon, Chief William Kamanda Algonquin, Prophecy and the Rainbow People. So I'll turn it over to Greg, please, to share that now. This, I'll just <laughs> tell you that this first video um, is nine minutes long. It's a great way to get to know grandfather. He talks about the lessons he learned as a child and the need to preserve the knowledge of the elders. At the end, he leaves us with a prayer spoken in the language of his people and then some powerful words in our language that tells us the importance of prophecy and connecting with the great spirit. So let's watch the video. sitting on the floor and playing something on the floor. Then you walk in. He said, mind if I join you guys? He started t telling us the, the stories about animals. Some funny stories. There was a fight between a fox and a skunk. And he wanted to know all of us, which side he would win. We all, all say the fox, the fox is bigger, and uh, it's just like a dog. He could eat, he could kill a, a skunk. He says, you're all wrong. He says, it's a skunk. Then we, we ask question, how come? It's small, it's not more than six inches tall from the ground. It might be small, he says, but with the gun that he carries, no one wants to run that so close. <laughs> the four I voices, I want, I want you to know. Try to be good with each other. You see anyone hungry? best to feed them. Try to not to hate, he said. He said, the reason I'm telling you this, because what, what you do to people if you're bad, these things come back at you. It might take years, or it could be your grandchildren. Nobody knows when. Remember this. Columbus, he came with one ship and he was given a tierra, pure gold. Indians had made it for him while he was there and he went home with that. 1493, he met Pope Alexander and he showed him his, his gold. The Pope asked if we were Christians. Columbus said, I don't think so. They're very friendly people. All at once, he says, 17 ships came over. And just by seeing an Indian, he 
shot and down. Without a word. It was a woman carrying a baby. She was shot down. And shot the baby witness. So that's why I'm telling you this. It's some days these guys knew would be. And when that happens, just take care of your children and teach them. Our mothers, we cannot wonder, how can you buy rain, he says. How can you, how can you buy the wind? All this, maybe some of yours will, will remember this. I was five years old. Ancestors that the grandmothers long time ago in the 1700s. They have these predictions. Someday you'll see the people, the way they will, they were reborn inside Indian body, not knowing what's happening. Someday they will be born, these people, inside the Indian bodies, and they will be called rainbow people. Today, it's lots of that today, and they're helping the Indians to organize. There's hope everything that they do with us, because I think they were, they were saying that that time, the grandmothers, that said that they will, be, they will be the people that will transform their own government by talking to them themselves, their, 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 uh, their chiefs, the way chiefs will be transformed by them. And I believe that. Was possible, we won't, we won't achieve to, to do our good things. I don't believe in violence. I don't believe in going to smash the windows in Ottawa in Parliament or throw, throw bombs on it. That's not the way to live. Tell the truth, tell them the truth and love them anyway. We have to respect them. Someday they will understand you. Here, good day, I'm going to be a bit more than a snap in my heart. It's a minute, and I'm going to be a bit more than a concept, and I'm going to be a bit more than a bit more than a bit more than a bit more in <laughs> In our, in our life, why we live. Always think the Creator for all the things He grants us to give us life, 
give us health and also to help our children to be able to keep the language and to talk about these things between themselves in a good way, not to plan the bad things, just to, to plan the good ways to teach each other and then whatever it is to work together. Give me with Michael, please give us your thoughts um, about Grandfather William Commanda and his message. Thank you. It's, uh, it's very touching to be able to see uh, William speak In 1996, uh, Susan and I and Aurora, 20 days old, met William Commanda in Manawaki, Quebec. And from that moment until he passed on August the 3rd, 2011, we spent incredibly rich time with Grandfather William. Almost immediately, we embarked on a, on a five-year journey uh, with Grandfather, uh, touring about... Uh, interviewing elders, Canada, United States, Mexico, Peru, and being introduced to the Red Road through an elder um, who exemplified all the qualities of what an elder displays, which is, I think, the very first quality that you observe is humility. Grandfather was deep. His thoughts were deep. I can remember so many mornings in his home, waking up to a sage-filled house. He would, he would smudge every morning with a tremendous amount of sage, always thanking the creator for another day, always giving thanks. Uh, despite what he knew was the background of his people, despite what he knew was, in, in essence, a relationship of genocide. Uh, but because his... But because his connection to spirit was so strong, he was able to tell his people that this had to be overcome, that they had to be forgiven, that they had to be loved. He would often say, I know what your people did to my people, but we're here to forgive you, and we just want to talk. That was the essence of his message all the way through. One mind, one heart, one soul one prayer, one direction. And grandfather was intimate with prophecy. He understood the strength of prophecy and what it meant to his people. The three belts, the three wampum belts, the three sacred wampum belts that he carried, the three finger belt, the three figure belt, I'm sorry, the J Treaty belt and the Seven Fires Prophecy belt. Today, we're going to hear about the Seven Fires Prophecy belt which is ancient, an ancient prophecy about the seven generations and what they all stood for and what they stand for in the future. Grandfather was particularly taken with the white buffalo calf prophecy, which for everyone's edification, the Reader's Digest version is as follows. It is said that white buffalo calf woman came to the Lakota people to bring them the spiritual teachings in the spiritual pipe. The stem represented the male, the bowl represented the female, 
and the smoke represented the prayer. <clears throat> it's a much longer explanation as to the teachings that reside within the pipe. But today that white buffalo calf pipe is carried by Arvo looking horse of the Lakota people. Going into 20 generations of the carrying of that pipe. When she gave the teachings, white buffalo calf woman said to them, I will give you a prophecy. And it is called the white buffalo calf prophecy as follows. You will know the changing times are upon you when there is born a white buffalo calf. You will know it is the white buffalo calf of the prophecy because on the day of its birth, the father will die, evidencing the death of the patriarchal system and the rebirth of the matriarchal system. You will know it is the white buffalo calf of the prophecy because after its birth, it will change all colors of humanity and then go back to white. On August the 3rd, 1994, in Janesville, Wisconsin, born to white ranchers was a white buffalo calf. On the day of its birth, the father died of a brain aneurysm. After its birth, it turned all colors of humanity and went back to white. So we are in the times of the white buffalo calf prophecy. We are in the changing times. And these issues are spoken about in the seven fires prophecy that you're about to see. There's not enough that I can say about William Commanda, for he is a legend, and his legacy lives on in our hearts, those of us who knew him. We are all deeply touched by what he taught us. What he extended to me and my family is beyond comprehension that he took us as his students, more importantly, as his family, and embraced us and assisted us to understand the Red Road better than most who are of the Red Road. He incorporated us into his existence and he assisted us to see by taking the scales off our eyes. Love is his message always love and compassion, forgiveness. These are the themes of William Commander. Grandfather William was also deeply attached to the eagle and the condor prophecy, which again speaks to the changing times. It speaks to the idea that when the condor of the South and the eagle of the North exchange their medicines and their ceremonies that we are moving into the changing times. This prophecy is known by all indigenous people and in their hearts, they understand that the time for reconciliation is upon us, but that the dominant society does not understand the term. It has been a long time coming, but it is coming. It will occur. Just as grandfather said, there will come a time when they will listen. And when they listen, they will begin to hear. And when they hear, things will begin to change. That time is upon us. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Michael. So let's move to video two. It's the Seven Fires Prophecy, Grandfather William Commanda and Elder Claudette Commanda. So this is a presentation of the Seven Fires Prophecy. And the producer, Jaguar Bird, said he considers this to be one of the most important prophecies of wisdom and truth. He says he created this film in the hope that many more of our young people and our elders will experience and benefit from the wisdom and the warnings. The source of the story is from the Mishomi book, The Voice of the Ojibwe, written by Edward Benton Benai, first published in 1979. Let's watch the video.
The seven prophets came to Anishinaabe. They came at a time when the people were living a full and peaceful life on the northeastern coast of North America. These prophets left the people with seven predictions of what the future would bring. Each of the prophecies was called a fire. And each fire referred to a particular era of time that would come in the future. Thus, the teachings of the seven prophets are now called the seven fires. The first prophet said to the people, in the time of the first fire, the Anishinaabe nation will rise up and follow the sacred shell of the Medewan Lodge. The Medewan Lodge will serve as a rallying point for the people and its traditional ways will be the source of much strength. The sacred mages will lead the way to the chosen ground of the Anishinaabe. You are to look for a turtle-shaped island that is linked to the purification of the earth. You will find such an island at the beginning and the end of your journey. There will be seven stopping places along the way. You will know the chosen ground has been reached when you come to a land where food grows on water. If you do not move, you will be destroyed. The second prophet told the people, you will know the second fire because at the time, the nation will be camped by a large body of water. In this time, the direction of the sacred shell will be lost. The Medewin will diminish in strength. A boy will be born to point the way back to the traditional ways. He will show the direction to the stepping stones to the future of the Anishinaabe people. The third prophet said to the people, in the third fire, the Anishinaabe will find the path to their chosen ground, a land in the west to which they must move their families. This will be the land where food grows on water. The fourth fire was originally given to the people by two prophets. They came as one. They told of the coming of the light-skinned race. One of the prophets said, You will know the future of our people by the face of the light-skinned race wears. If they come wearing the face of brotherhood, then there will come a time of wonderful change for generations to come. They will bring new knowledge and articles that can be joined with the knowledge in, of this country. In this way, two nations will join to make a mighty nation. This new nation will be joined by two more, so that four will form the mightiest nation of all. You will know the face of brotherhood if the light-skinned race comes carrying no weapons. If they come bearing only their knowledge and a handshake. The other prophet said, Beware if the light-skinned race comes wearing the face of death. You must be very careful because the face of brotherhood and the face of death look very much alike. If they come carrying a weapon, beware. If they come in suffering, they could fool you. Their hearts may be filled with greed for the riches of the land. If they are indeed your brothers, let them prove it. Do not accept them in total trust. You shall know that the face they wear is one of death, if the rivers run with poison and the fish becomes unfit to eat. You shall know them by these many things. The fifth prophet said, In the time of the fifth fire there will come a time of great struggle that will grip the lives of all native peoples. At the warning of this fifth fire, there will come among the people one who holds a promise of great joy and salvation. If the people accept this promise of a new way, 
and abandon the old teachings, then the struggle of the fifth fire will be with the people for many generations. The promise that comes will prove to be a false promise. All those who accept this promise will cause the near destruction of the people. The prophet of the sixth fire said, in the time of the sixth fire it will be evident that the promise of the fifth fire came in a false way. Those deceived by this promise will take their children away from the teachings of the elders. Grandsons and granddaughters will turn against the elders. In this way, the elders will lose their reason for living. They will lose their purpose in life. At this time, a new sickness will come among the people. The balance of many people will be disturbed. The cup of life will almost be spilled. The cup of life will almost become the cup of grief. At the time of these predictions, many people scoffed at the prophets. They then had medicines to keep away sickness. They were then healthy and happy as a people. These were the people who chose to stay behind in the great migration of the Anishinaabe. These people were the first to have contact with the light-skinned race. They would suffer most. When the fifth fire came to pass, a great struggle indeed did grip the lives of all native people. The light-skinned race launched a military attack on the Indian people throughout the country aimed at taking away their land and their independence as a free and sovereign people. It is now felt that the false promise that came at the end of the fifth fire was the materials and riches embodied in the way of life of the white skin race. Those who abandoned the ancient ways and accepted this new promise were a big factor in causing the near destruction of the native people of this land. When the sixth fire came to be, the words of the prophet rang true, as children were taken away from the teachings of the elders. The boarding school era of civilizing Indian children had begun. The Indian language and religion were taken from the children. The people started dying at an early age. They had lost their will to live and their purpose in living. In the confusing times of the sixth fire, it is said that a group of visionaries came from among the Anishinaabe. They gathered all the priests of the Nadewan Lodge. They told the priests that the Nadewan Lodge was in danger of being destroyed. They gathered all the sacred bundles. They gathered all the scrolls that recorded the ceremonies. All these things were placed in a hollowed out log from the ironwood tree. Men were lowered over a cliff by long ropes. They dug a hole in the cliff and buried the log where no one could find it. Thus the teachings of the elders were hidden out of sight, but not out of memory. It was said that when the time came that the Indian people could practice their religion without fear, a little boy would dream where the iron was locked, all of the sacred bundles and scrolls were buried. He would lead his people to that place. The seven prophets that came to the people long ago were said to be different from the other prophets. He was young and had a strange light in his eyes. He said, in the time of the seven fire, new people will emerge. They will retrace their steps to find 
that was left by the trail. Their steps will take them to the elders, who they will ask to guide them on their journey. But many of the elders will have fallen asleep. They will awaken to this new time with nothing to offer. Some of the elders will be silent out of fear. Some of the elders will be silent because no one will ask anything of them. The new people will have to be careful in how they approach the elders. The task for the new people will not be easy. If the new people will remain strong in their quest, the water drum of the Midwaven Lodge will again sound its voice. There will be a rebirth of the Anishinaabe nation and a rekindling of the world flames. The sacred fire will again be lit. It is at this time that the light-skinned race will be given a choice between two roads. If they choose the right road, the seventh fire will light the eighth and final fire. An eternal fire of peace, love, brotherhood, and sisterhood. If the light-skinned race makes the wrong choice of the roads, then the destruction which they brought back with them in coming to this country will come back at them and cause much suffering and death to all of Earth's children. Traditional Mide people of Ojibwe and people from other nations have interpreted the two roads that face the light-skinned race as the road to technology, the other road to spiritualism. They feel that the road to technology represents a continuation of the headlong rush to technological development. This is the road that has led to modern society to a damaged and seared earth. Could it be that the road to technology represents a rush to destruction? The road to spirituality represents a slower path the traditional native people have traveled and are now seeking again. The earth is not scorched on this trail. The grass is still growing there. The prophet of the fourth fire spoke of a time when two nations will join to make a mighty nation. He was speaking of the coming of the light-skinned race in the face of brotherhood that the light-skinned brother could be wearing. It is obvious from the history of this country that this was not the face worn by the light-skinned race as a whole. That mighty nation spoken of in the fourth fire has never yet been formed. If the natural people of the earth to just wear the face of brotherhood, we might be able to deliver our society from the road of destruction. Could we make the two roads that today represent two clashing worldviews come together to form a mighty nation? Could a nation be formed that is guided by respect for all living things? Are we the new people of the seventh fire? Thank you, Greg, for your tech support and playing that. 
um, such a powerful message. And I look forward to your thoughts, Michael, on um, how we can take this message and use it for our own transformation and freedom, evolution on this soul's journey. Thank you. Well, as, as powerful as those words are, bring to your imagination uh, a man such as William Kamanda carrying those sacred wampum belts um, during his lifetime and living exactly uh, what the Seven Fires Prophecy Belt speaks to. The, the concepts of transformation and freedom is our responsibility. We are the new people. We're definitely the ones who can embrace this message and begin to make the transformation happen within our own selves. It is said, of course, absent being able to love yourself, you're not going to be able to love others. And so that transformation begins as an inner journey uh, within our own makeup, being able to incorporate the principles uh, that William Commanda spoke to and all of his legacy <clears throat> continues to speak to. It doesn't go, um, or it doesn't take very much to observe the kind of situation we find ourselves in in the world. It replicates everything that is said in the seven fires prophecy, the past, the present, and the future. All of this predicted in prophecy. And this is why the indigenous people are so attached to prophecy because of its accuracy, the ability to demonstrate with accuracy what has taken place in the past, what is going on in the present, and what could take place in the future. We are the new people. We are the ones who are responsible to bring about this transformation, to assist in bringing about freedom for all. Um, the two dueling paths, if you will, are very, very obvious. And all you hear about today is artificial intelligence, um, which is the ruin on the path of technology. In that on that path, we're headed inexorably confusion and chaos. The control uh, that it speaks to uh, can be defeated through our hearts. And we have to become heart-minded rather than thinking through our mind. We should be thinking through our hearts. And this is the message of William Commanda. Always, always think through your heart. And when we only think through our head, we skip the heart. This is the presence of love within each and every one of us. And as we express that love and as we express compassion, we build not only that muscle, but we build a collective movement towards the spiritual path. Our whole purpose in Soul School Network is to bring these kinds of messages, have discussions about them, um, so that we can all begin to become connected collectively to the message of love and compassion and forgiveness. These are the benchmarks of advancement. These are the benchmarks of demonstrating the path that we are going down, which is the one of spirituality, the inner journey. I bless William Commanda. I bless him for what he has given to myself and my family, but I bless him for what he has done for humanity in his message that was constant, never, never wavering, always the same ideas that we must advance through our hearts. The soul will guide us. The mantra of unification, for instance, that beautiful line in it, let the soul control the outer form and life and all events. It is your capital S self, which, which will bring about this transformation, which will bring about this freedom. 
So thank you, uh, Grandfather William Commander. You touch our hearts. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So I'm wondering if anybody has any questions for Michael. This would be a good opportunity. We're at six minutes to the hour. You can raise your virtual hand or turn on your camera and raise your hand. Michelle, please go ahead. I was wondering if there is a way for technology and spirituality to coexist. There, there is, there is a, a, a way that they can coexist and it's called consciousness. And the consciousness that directs the technology is the critical piece. Because if the consciousness that directs the technology is absent spiritual understanding, is absent spiritual knowing, uh, then the materialism uh, will overwhelm uh, the direction of the technology. This is exactly what we're seeing today, is that when we do not have a consciousness of love and compassion and forgiveness informing the technology, uh, then the technology unfortunately takes over and runs away. There's a deep, deep reason why we have technology. Um, and, and it's cosmic. It's a cosmic undertaking. It comes from extraterrestrials. So it comes from off-planetary beings who may or may not um, have the kind of heart that is required in order to uh, evolve the soul. This is, this is where it is. Um, the idea of technology, um, yes, I, I, I see within the, the word tech, uh, telecommunication, telephone, telepathy. Thanks, Sarah. I appreciated those prompts because they're, they're good. They're, they're very good. We have to um, be conscious of what is motivating the technology. And yes, it can marry with spirituality, but it requires the rainbow bridge, which is in essence, the development of love, compassion, and forgiveness in the consciousness, which informs the technology. Michelle, thank you. That's a great question. Uh, any other questions or comments? I just want to say, I I know you had a really strong emotional connection with, with him, and it's very clear that you were very close to him. I can see Thank you. Questions. Thank you, Michelle. It's true. It's even hearing his voice. Very touching for us. Um, and, you know, I'm new to managing YouTube live streams, so I don't know if there are questions that can come through that way. Um, uh, oh, actually, I can see that. Yeah, I see comments. That's great. I don't see any questions right now. Um Okay, so we're at three minutes to the hour. And I thank you all for being here and for those who joined on YouTube live stream. Um, I know there's so many places you could be, especially these days with technology. And we appreciate that you chose to be here. Please do visit our website. Uh, we will have the recordings of these meetings. Last week's is there. Um, you could subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, we have some interesting speakers ahead and some, no doubt, some controversial topics as well. Greg might need to, you know, edit those videos so we don't get bumped off uh, social media. <laughs> we'll see. Um, we always welcome your suggestions and your feedback. We're on the road to spirituality together, whether we know it or not. And so we appreciate 
<clears throat> this community of people coming together. Um, we've chosen to end all our meetings with the Mantrum of Unification, which is on the website. And so I'm going to share my screen for those of you who um, <clears throat> don't know the Mantrum of Unification so that you can say it along and um, Michael uh, will lead us in that. If you would please go ahead, Michael. <clears throat> The mantrum of unification. The souls of all are one and I am one with them. I seek to love, not hate. I seek to serve and not exact due service. I seek to heal, not hurt. Let pain bring due reward of light and love. Let the soul control the outer form and life and all events and bring to light the love that underlies the happenings of the time. Let vision come and future stand revealed. Let inner union demonstrate and outer cleavages be gone. Let love prevail, let all humanity love. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everybody. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Have a wonderful week. Much love to each and every one of you. Hope to see you soon. Take care. Bye. Bye for now. Thank you. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. Nice to see you. Awesome. Thank you for the reminders. <laughs>